You know, I, uh, I preached this, this same text at the 845 where I was addressing what I call the traditional church. And um, I, I certainly, I think, had a powerful message to them. And I hope if you're, um, if you're interested in hearing this from what I said to what I think the church needs to hear, I, I hope you'll get a tape of that. I think God uh, used me this morning in that early service. I often feel like that your generation um, has a, a different perspective. You, you have not experienced some of the nitpicking legalism that has been our traditions, and thank God for it. And I have real hope that you will not let yourself be pulled into that. Amen? I mean, um, <laughs> I, I just think about some of the ridiculous things I've been told in the past in God's name, and you just go, holy moly. And you know, holy moly, that's serious. Um, this text is, you have to look at these Bible texts in two ways. We cannot just jump into a book and pull out of some verses that kind of, sort of, could fit what we want to say to our day. That's just inappropriate. We need to look at what this book was saying to its day. Now, I want to remind you of this principle. I think it's a valid principle. We, we start interpreting the Bible and we judge others' interpretation of the Bible by does what you say fit what the original inspired author was saying to the people who first heard it. Now, we call that authorial intent, okay? And that's how you judge the appropriateness or inappropriateness of interpretations. But, though every text has one meaning... And that's the, what the original author intended. It was the original hearers would have understood. Every text has multiple significances. And by that I mean this inspired text given to a particular people in a particular culture is addressing a universal need or theme. And we can take this truth once we fully understand it in its own context and we can apply it to our day bring the significance into our world. And the challenge for the teacher or preacher is to present the implications of the original truth with the same power that the original hearers would have understood. Well, when it comes to this closing chapter of Galatians, I want to remind you a couple of things. And these should be the pillars under which we look at this text. This church, group of churches really, is being disrupted by false teachers who are advocating a type of legalism that focused on us being acceptable to God by conforming to an outward code. This particular code is Judaism. And these, these new believers were struggling. They had accepted the gospel, but they were struggling with this new legalism. But these uh, churches were also in, in, in some, some disarray. And I want to remind you, hope you have your Bibles with you. It is church. You need to bring your Bible or your, your iPhone. I know that <laughs> the new generation looks at the Bible on the iPhone. So there it is. There it is. Um, look it up. <laughs> look with me. Chapter 5, verse 16 and 29. I believe it's either 15. It's where it describes how they're treating each other. And they were biting each other and devouring each other and comparing themselves. It, it was a terrible thing. Now that, that is the setting. False teachers and a church that for whatever reason is disrupted. And one more. You've got to think about one more. When, back in chapter 5, we listed a number of sins. I believe it's about verse 19 and 20 right in there. Now these sins would not fit the Jewish false teachers, but they would fit people who are coming straight out of paganism and had trusted Christ. But in paganism, they worship the gods. And you would be terribly surprised at how much drunkenness and sexual immorality, uh, strange procedures like going to a temple of Apollo and lying on the floor and letting pythons crawl over you as a way to be healed. Oh, they were coming out of all of that superstitious. And some of, the, some of that is still in these believers' lives. And that's what these sins in chapter 5 are. So now Paul is addressing 
only a part of this church. Now, church is. Now, think with me. He's going to say brothers. Now, I hope you realize that brothers is Paul's way of transitioning to a new subject. It's his textual marker for a new subject. Okay? Brother. Now, notice what he says. If anyone is of you is caught in a trespass. And there are several really important things. The word if here is a word that means it could happen, it might happen. It's not saying it, it is happening. Paul says there's potential problem here. If one of the believers, now the word, the word caught here is really the word surprised. Now, I need to take a minute on that. You mean Christians get surprised when they're caught? I think they, I think they are. I remember somebody, and I've forgotten where, you know, at this point in my life, I've heard some really good stuff from really great people and have just stole it and forgotten where I got it. So, yeah, steal it. I don't, I don't know where I got it. I hope it was the spirit. But, uh, you know, <laughs> we need to prepare for possible crisis in our lives before they happen. We need to make decisions about some things before the temptation, the crisis the moment comes. If we have prepared, now how do we prepare? The Word of God, prayer, association with godly people, a regular worship. These are preparations for crisis. So when the crisis comes, the decision has already been made. Now if you wait till the moment and then you're going to pray, and then, the, it's a downward slippery slope. So, Paul is saying, look, if you're, if you're surprised, if you're caught in something, now it's got to be connected with the false teachers, pagan worship, a griping in the church, those are the possible context. We're still responsible for the choices we make. I, I come back and again and again. It's not that I'm, I'm mad at John Calvin. To tell you the truth, I think John Calvin is not a Calvinist. <laughs> what did you think about that? It's Calvin's followers that radicalize Calvin's positions. And I think John Calvin in his writings, particularly the Institutes, admits there is this element of human choice. Now, what we've done in our society, and I hope, I hope your age can hear me. Our sociologists have taken everything and made it a disease. We did this terrible crime because we were not brought up well. Uh, we did this because our DNA pool, is, there's something wrong with our DNA and it, it's really not our fault. My friend, if the Bible says anything, now we're about to come to a text, the next, tomorrow, next sermon is, uh, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. Now that, what, that's a consequence verse. We are tricked. We are subtly tempted by evil. There are circumstances that lead us to make poor choices. But what we have got to say to Christians is, we've got to say it. We are responsible for our choices. That's true in the physical realm. That's true in the spiritual realm. So whether a person can blame this or that or this, this circumstance caused me, we've got to know that although this temptation is a, a panoply of temptations, we are responsible for our choices. We've got to take responsibility for our acts. There's just no other way to live in a moral universe. We can't say God caused it because God causes all things. We can't do the Flip Wilson. Now, I know most of you have no clue who Flip Wilson is. If you know Flip Wilson, would you raise your hand? Y'all are all older than dirt. Um, he used to have this, he, was like, he, he had the prettiest legs for a man I ever saw. And he would shave his legs, black comedian, and put on pantyhose, and uh, he became this, 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 this girl. Uh, what was her name? Geraldine, wasn't it? Geraldine, that's right. And she would, she would come out and say, the devil made me do it. Well, see, <laughs> she was deflecting moral responsibility. But on one side, we say, God made me do it. That's radical Calvinism. No, God didn't make you do it. He may have known you are going to do it. The other side is this radical attempt to say, the devil made me do it. Demons made me do it. I'm not responsible. Demon. No, my friend. 
is you have to open the door for the Holy Spirit to be active in your life. You have to open the door for evil to be active in your life. And we are responsible for the choices and consequences that occur. Now that's what we have to say to Christians today. And we don't say it in joy, and we don't say it with nanny nanny boo boo, but we must say choices have consequences, and it's hurting the kingdom of God. Now, I want to come back and I want to reiterate this, and I think this is um, it's something I didn't hear a lot when I was in, in church younger, but I think I'm, I'm just being consumed with it in the later years of my ministry. And that's this idea that I am saved to serve. I'm not saved to get. I'm not saved to prevent disease. I'm not saved for wealth. I'm not saved to be smarter. I'm not saved from problems. I'm not saved from tragedy. No, no. I'm saved to wash the people of God's feet. And that's not true of pastors. That's true of every gifted, called believer. And if you're a believer, you're called and gifted. So what I'm saying for you, the focus of our lives is not what do I get to do. The focus of our lives becomes what can I do for the health and growth of the body of Christ. You see, it is an evidence that the fall has been alleviated, the consequences, when no longer do I think about what's in it for me, what do I get, all that directed to the self. Suddenly, through the grace of God, Through the indwelling of the Spirit, through revelation, now I'm able to say, Lord, how does this affect the church? How does this affect the people of God? How can I help others? How can I be a blessing? Now, see, that total reorientation is what occurs in Christian maturity. And when that's damaged, then Christians are going to fall into sin and self. Now... I don't know how to say this without getting emotional. I just don't know how to say it. There was a group of singers. uh, Young people would go out of high school and join this group called Continental Singers. You ever heard them, Continental Singers? They used to come around to churches and sing. One of their songs, it just haunts me, is Don't Let a Wounded Soldier Die. And it's a depiction, a military metaphor of the church as the army of God. And in ministry, in daily life, in worship, and praise, and service, and work, Christians get hurt and damaged. Christians make poor choices. And God help me, if it has not been my experience, that we whether shoot a wounded brother or sister, then we had to take the time and effort to restore them in love and then give them another place of responsibility. It's so much easier to turn the page and write that person off than it is to get down into the nitty-gritty and help somebody and forgive somebody and not talk about somebody and don't bring it up every time you see them and let them have another chance of responsibility. Now, I'm not saying we're covering up sin. Please don't hear me say that. And there are some sins that preclude certain areas of ministry from then on. But I think the will of God is like the forks of a tree. At every fork, there is a new will of God. And though a choice back here may have cut this whole branch off as a possibility, I I understand that, there is another fork and another opportunity for meaningful, healthy, uh, corporate blessing in the life of every believer. And we get so stinking judgmental and self-righteous And we can't because all of us continue to struggle with sin and make poor choices. And I guess what I'm pleading for, pleading for, is that we be kind and patient to one another. Not forgiving sin, not brushing it on the carpet, not, not ignoring it. No, no. Repenting, turning from, and allowing the forgiveness and forgetfulness of God to flow through us onto the body of Christ. You see, I think many of you are so young, you haven't experienced some of the terrible things that happens in churches. Some of the terrible unforgiveness. Some of the, some of the people who are damaged young. I, I, I was saying in the early service, if First Baptist Monroe would just commit themselves to the damaged brothers and sisters within a five-mile radius of this church, there wouldn't be enough room in this building for multiple services on Sunday morning. 
But somehow those who get wounded, hurt, for whatever reason, I don't, I don't, there is a responsibility. But for whatever reason, they feel like the church doesn't love them. They feel like the church doesn't care. They feel like there's no place for them. We've got to overcome that with what? Foot washing, loving, not in it for me, service to others. And if we will love them, they will love others. And if we can start a pattern, there's no telling what the church of God can be in our culture. <laughs> but um, I'm going to use another metaphor. I think this came from, uh, I was trying to think of his name. His last name is Matheson. I think it's, he was an ethics professor at Southwestern Seminary. He said that modern America likes to put truth on placards. And well, we should. There's danger. Placards. And they stand at the top of the cliff with a placard. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And the warning is necessary. But what they will not do is man an ambulance at the foot of the cliff. So when baby Christians and non-Christians run through the warning signs, we love them broken at the bottom of the cliff. (laughs) I call you to man the ambulances of a culture who thinks it's religious but has self-righteously beat up one another in one upsmanship in the church. We are not known as a loving, kind, generous, arms out fellowship. We're known as a legalistic, dogmatic, judgmental, look like us, act like us, or don't come. Brothers, If anyone is surprised in a trespass, you who are spiritual. Now, I've got to define you who are spiritual because that comes across like you super Christian. There is no super Christians. There's just big weenies who've been saved by grace. Jerks. Been touched by the forgiveness of God. So what does it mean, you who are spiritual? It's certainly not sinless. It's certainly not perfect in every area, mature in every area, complete Bible knowledge. None of that. So what is it? Let's look at the context. I hope you got your Bibles or your iPod. I'm watching you as you go back. Chapter 5, verses 16 through 18 describes a mature Christian. Uh, Chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit describes a mature Christian. Uh, In my notes, I made a list. Let's see if you buy this. Now, this is Bob, not Bible, but I'm trying to think from the context what is a spiritual Christian. Having the mind of Christ... Living out the fruit of the Spirit, having a servant's heart, and being willing to serve fellow Christians. Now see, today, quite often we want positions on the platform. I promise you, the platform is one of many gifts. And if there's not care and compassion in the pews, the platform can make no difference in the life of the church. Platform may attract, but unless the church is a community of love and service, it, they, people will not stick. They will not stick. We need spiritual people. What is that? The mind of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, a servant's heart, the willingness to serve, not get. And how often have I heard people say, well, that church just doesn't feed me. That church just doesn't meet my need. They just... see." Don't you see that American mentality of what can you do for me instead of the gospel mentality? What can I do for you? It's a total reorientation of your mind and heart. Here's a broken person. They made a stupid choice. Uh, The consequences are terrible. God will have to deal with that. But could God flow through you to put an arm around a broken, hurting, confused, sinful brother or sister and say, I want you to know God will forgive you. Uh, This isn't the unpardonable sin. Uh, Come on, let's walk together. I'll walk with you. I'll go with you. I'll be with you. (laughs) You who are spiritual, restore such a one. Now, the word restore here is a present imperative, which means it's an ongoing lifestyle command from an inspired text. 
You mean I need to see my job in the body, no matter what gift I have, no matter what place of service I have, that God's will for the life of a believer is to help restore those who have been surprised or caught in a trespass? Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say. It is crucial for those who are mature in Christ to help others in the church attain maturity. That's Ephesians 4.13. Till we all attain to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. The goal is Christ's likeness. The way to Christ's likeness is self-giving love. There's no other way. It's not through power. It's through love. It's through service. Now, the next, I think the next one is, is, is very powerful. Looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. The minute the spiritual one reaches out, they've got to be careful of that still, small voice. Now, in my, in my mind, there, when I think, it's, it's not audible, but it's, it's me. There's sometimes I never know what that thinking process is. Is it Bob? Could be. Is it God? Could be. Is it the evil one? It could be. How do I know? What it says, does it line up with scripture? And I guarantee you, Satan's not going to tell you, go love them, go serve them, go help them find God's forgiveness. And I guarantee you're not going to say that because it's messy and miserable and it's no fun. But I guarantee the spirit of God saying that. And while we help them, we've got to watch out. That still small voice doesn't say, aren't I wonderful? (laughs) No, you're just a jerk being used by God. No, you're not. Now, the word here for tempt, there are two words in Greek. There's a word that means to tempt for destruction. That's what Satan did for Jesus in the temptation of Matthew 4 and Luke 4. There's another word, translated the same way, test, tempt, or try, that's from metallurgy, used to heat up ore to get out the impurities out of the metal. Now, both those words are used in these five verses, these first, this first paragraph. This one is the word that is used to destruction. Do you mean that if I don't look out for myself when I'm trying to help others, that I can be in trouble? Yes. I don't know how many Christian counselors I know have got into trouble. (laughs) Best motives, but trouble. Do you mean we've always got to be on guard? Yes. Because destruction can come. Destruction of what? Witness, ministry, joy, peace, service. The next verse, in verse 2, bear one another's burdens. Now, (laughs) I guess the text that is really really impress me on this is and I hope when you go home this afternoon I hope you'll read this it, it, I'm not going to read it now it's over a chapter long it won't take you but a minute but it's it's I think the definitive passage in all the New Testament on the two different kinds of Christians now Paul calls them weak and strong I, I think that's pejorative but he's inspired and so we'll let him keep what he wants to call them but uh, weak and strong and it says this you who are strong is the implication, except the weaker brother without disputing doubtful points. That's 14.1, Romans 14.1, which says to me, Bob, it is not your job to accept based on whether someone fits your criteria. It is not your job to change people into your criteria. It is your job to love people in the name of Jesus Christ and lovingly accept them. And then it's God's Spirit's job to convict and get that person to move in light of their own understanding. Now, what we have here is bear one another's burdens is if you consider yourself a mature Christian, a spiritual Christian, a strong Christian, that means you're a perfect Christian. But it does mean that when we see a brother in need, now the word for the word burden here is a word for overloading an animal be it a camel or a donkey in this part of the world, and you put so much weight on that animal, it breaks down their legs and they can't get up. They can't move. They're immobile with this weight. So the metaphor here is you come and unpack some of that weight and you put that weight on your back and you carry that weight until the brother or sister can carry that weight again. 
That, that, that's the metaphor here. And does that mean that my responsibility in the church is beyond my personal choices? Yes, that's what I'm trying to say. How do I get... Th- it's not that you made the best choices. It's not that you didn't do that. That's good. God bless you. But there's more. And the more is you got to make a real good choice to help out the other Christian. An intentional, daily, purposeful choice. And where are these broken Christians? They're everywhere. (laughs) They're everywhere. And they're just looking for somebody to be a real Christian for them. It's, It's the guy at work. It, it, it's the girl at the, the supermarket. It's the lawn people. It's the person walking down the street. And somehow, if when the Spirit of God finds a vessel that he can reach out through, suddenly the world becomes an opportunity for the love of Christ to flow through you to others. I, w- I was talking to Mike. I'm just going to share our little vision, Mike. That's all right. If it isn't, just wave your hand. You got a new pastor coming the 26th, right? It's a new day. Why don't we take the opportunity to go to our the roles of our Sunday school for those who haven't been in years and ask our active Sunday school to call two or three and say whatever happened in the past, I don't know. If you're going to church to somewhere, great. But if you haven't gone to church anywhere, you're not active. We're we're starting a brand new day. 11 o'clock on the 26th. I'd just like you to come. Would you sit with me and come? I'll I'll come get you. Would would you come? If if you're not active, would you come? Don't let the wounded soldier die. Make it your call, your task, your job. It's not not the pastors or the staff. It's it's ours. It's us reaching one another. It's us trying to find those who are hurt and saying, no, no, Jesus really has made a difference in my life. I, I care for you. Uh, you're important to God. You're important to the kingdom. Well, we, we want you. We want you. There are no throwaway people for us. New day. New day. If we could just do it. And thereby fulfill the law of Christ. And there, there is some do's and don'ts in Christianity. I agree. With, I think that's true. I like the way James put this. I think it's a parallel in James. He calls it the flawless law that makes men free. That's James 1.25. This is James 2.8. The royal law. James 2.15. The law of liberty. That's what we're giving to people. I've been trying to kid you by saying we're not on the credentials committee. We're on the welcoming committee. <laughs> We may not be the emergency room workers, but we are the ambulance drivers. <laughs> We're to try to get that dead corpse to some who can help them, right? And we need to be available when the call comes and the opportunity comes, whenever it comes, for whoever it comes. Why? Because they deserve it? No, because of who you are in Christ. Who you are. Not who they are. Who you are. Who you are. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, this is a first class conditional sentence assumed to be true. There are people in the church, every church I've been to, there are people who think they're something. You may have met those. The truth is, we've got to be terribly careful here. The minute we step out and in any kind of setting of trying to restore, we've got to be careful we don't come across as self-righteous, judgmental, and know-it-all. We've got to come across as a loving fellow pilgrim. Not a guru. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Self-deception is the worst blindness possible when we put out our own eyes and only see our strengths and never acknowledge our weaknesses. We're all broken. We're all struggling. We're all fellow pilgrims. If, it's like that book, Everything I Needed I Learned in Kindergarten. <laughs> if we hold hands with each other and we don't bite and kick and love one another, life will be all right. 
Life will be all right. Yeah, there's some rough patches. If we hold hands and we're nice to each other, we can make it. We can make it. But in America, we tend to isolate the individual, magnify the importance of the individual, and ignore the corporate responsibility. But each of you must examine his own work. This is the other word for test, try, or tempt. We must actually look at what we're doing in the Christian life. It is so important that we find out what church means to the inspired New Testament first century church and not what church means to the 21st century American church. Because we define church as a building and a time and a day. But the New Testament defines the church as a body, as a fellowship, as a new world view, as a future um, kingdom here on earth now. And then finally, and then we will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, but not with regard to another. May I say the worst thing we can possibly do is compare ourselves with each other? Uh, the, the example I used this morning is still a powerful example for me. I, I hope it is for you. I, I, you all watch the Winter Olympics, I'm sure, and the ice skating is so beautiful. Uh, I happened to hear one of the female ice skaters, uh, Peggy Fleming, these years ago. They asked her, um, she was early 20, she just won the, the, the gold medal. Or, and they said, well, how many years have you been skating? She said, I've been skating since I was eight years old. They said, well, how many hours a day do you practice? She said, I practice eight hours a day, seven days a week, since I was 80 years old. Now, she was the best woman skater, and she only could hold that for a year or two. The, the physical body is such you can't stay best in anything forever. And if you're best in something, you won't be best in that next year. So if you're, if you're waiting to find your self-worth in that you do something really well... It's just a matter of time till you find somebody who does it a whole lot better. And if, you're, if you compare, if you say, well, I do better than that person, what you're really doing is making yourself feel better at someone else's expense. And instead of making yourself feel better by comparing yourself with them, what I'm saying to you is get down, put your arm around them, and lift them up. Now that impresses God. Guess what I'm saying? Are you willing to be the hand of Jesus in the life of your friends every day? This morning, uh, after service, I was thinking of this. I want another preacher's opinion, so I'm looking at you. We often, you know, say we count evangelism as here is the potential for a new servant for the church, right? We're talking about discipleship and growth. And we win somebody so the church can have a new worker. I, I do believe that. We, we, people are not saved for a ticket to heaven. They are saved for the goal of serving the church. Clint, do you think it's fair to say that restoring a brother has the same effect for the church as evangelism? So if you're a committed evangelical for saving people's souls, can I say to you that loving and restoring a wounded soldier can have the same effect for the kingdom of God as a decision to salvation? It's pretty radical. But I do think it's true. Because what we need is people who love each other, not because the other person is worthy, but because they met Jesus Christ and they can't get over it. And one hour a week in a building isn't enough. And when I see a person, I don't want to be taken advantage of. No, I, I don't want to do that. And I, I, and I don't want to be goody two-shoes. But I want to be available. I want to be available, God, when that still small voice, no matter where, no matter what, says, Bob, put your arm around that person and love them for me. I want to be sensitive enough to hear that voice. And I want to be available enough to act when I hear that voice. I don't act to act every time to every person. I can't. I just can't. But I need to be available. I need to be willing to hear that voice. And to be that hand. And to be that voice of forgiveness. 
and, and to come alongside. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He comes alongside. I need to be a paraclete for another person in Christ. I haven't done this sermon as well as I did the first one. It, it's so hard for me to repeat these emotional sermons. Young people, I'm just saying my, my prayer is that you'll do it different. That your generation will do it different than we've done it. We've lost America. We've lost several generations because of our denominational arrogance and legalism. Young people, Jesus is bigger than that. And he wants to flow through you. And he wants to flow to people. And the question is, are you available? It's not, do they look like you, act like you? Are they going to join where you? It's not the question. Are you available? To be the continuing incarnation. Are you available to love people who are hurt and unloving and sometimes abusive even? Are you, and we're not going to restore them to what they were. That's, that's gone. That's damaged. That, that witness is it. But we can restore them to a meaningful place of ministry if loving people will surround them. <laughs> well, Lord... I, I don't know quite what to do. I feel like that you have uh, been involved in this message because it turned so many different ways than I prepared it. But I never know exactly what you want to do. I guess practically, Lord, if, if somebody has come to mind, somebody in the mind of any person in this auditorium, be it a relative, be it a neighbor, be it a co-worker, be it a church member, I... If someone has come to mind that's hurting and wounded, mad at the church, mad at God, feels neglected, feels unloved. Lord, if you put somebody in the mind, this your children, who happen to be here today, I pray they would act on it. Maybe they don't know exactly what to do. Show them gently what to do. Lord, help us be a church that reaches out in the name and hand of Jesus to those who don't know you and those who know you and those who know you and have been wounded. And we know they're all around. We know they're all around. Please, Lord, give us spiritual sensitivity. Give us eyes to see and the powerful hand and tongue to respond. Help us be the people of God in our day. Help us really be the church. Have mercy on us. Send the fullness of the Spirit.